I ran downstairs, checked in with Andy to make sure he was on board, which he overwhelmingly was. Boys, 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 call him over. My three eight-year-old sons come trotting over to the fridge and I throw open the doors with great panache and I declare, boys, we're going vegan. And they were like, yeah, what is vegan? <laughs> Inflammation, free radical formation, immune system function. Every time you chew and swallow, you're choosing to either promote cancer or kill cancer. No one wants to even think of kale as like releasing chemicals, but in point of fact, and this is important for my more scientifically minded people out there, that's what's so beautiful for a scientifically minded person coming to like the argument of plant-based or not, they will wrap their minds around the chemistry of it all and start to understand that truly on a molecular level, these plants are releasing chemicals that have effects on the downstream cellular functions. Hi everyone, this is Jenna Matecki from Plant Based News. I really hope that you enjoy this video, which is an interview with breast cancer surgeon, Dr. Christy Funk. If you get something out of this video, you will definitely get something out of a free premier summit linked below. The summit features Dr. Funk as well as 24 different experts in the fields of lifestyle medicine and conscious living. There's a quick trailer coming up about this event. And again, if you hit the link below this video, you'll get free access. Enjoy. The global pandemic has changed our world forever. Millions of lives have been lost and tragically, it's not over yet. And here's something that's really kind of important. Some of the biggest COVID-19 risk factors are what's called comorbidities. These include obesity, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, and other chronic illnesses. And the good news here is that whether or not you ever get COVID-19, the foods you eat and the choices you make today have the power to shape your destiny and your health for the rest of your life. Right now, it's more important than ever to clean up your diet to eat the foods that support your immune system. Scientific studies show us that eating the right foods can help you prevent and even reverse cancer, type two diabetes, autoimmune conditions, obesity, can help prevent Alzheimer's. And these foods really are your number one way to strengthen your heart, your brain, your microbiome, and your immune system. They can help you to have lasting energy, more satisfying sleep, and to set you up for a long, happy life. I'm Ocean Robbins, host of the Food Revolution Summit, and I want you to know the truth about your food. That's why my dad and colleague, two million copy, best-selling author John Robbins and I have teamed up with 24 of the world's most brilliant revolutionary experts to bring you this year's biggest breakthroughs in food and health. And because this information is so important, right now more than ever before, we're offering it to you completely for free. In this, the 10th anniversary Food Revolution Summit, you will find out what's really going on behind the scenes in our food system. You'll find out which foods you need to avoid and what the leading edge of medical science is discovering about how you can optimize your immune health, your brain health, and your heart health. Most importantly, you're gonna find hope for your future and real, actionable, scientifically grounded solutions that can improve your life and your world starting today. I can't wait to share it all with you. Remember, it's completely free. So go ahead and sign up right on this page. All you need to do is enter your name and email to reserve your spot right now. And I'll see you in the summit. Before we get started and talk all about plant-based nutrition, let's talk a little bit about the link between COVID-19 and breast cancer. Oh gosh, this is such an interesting and challenging and frightening intersection between a disease that's the number one cancer in America right now and this uncontrollable at the moment COVID virus. So what's happening is because of COVID fear, women are not getting screened. Breast imaging is down 62%. Genetic consults are down like 25%. Breast cancer surgery is down 21%. And the latest stats are that there is 50% less invasive breast cancer being diagnosed week after week in America. Okay. 
that's astounding. At first, people are like, oh, yay. Oh, wait. Yeah, because nothing, no intervention is ever going to slash breast cancer rates in half. So in point of fact, these cancers are there undetected, not sheltering in place. They're growing, multiplying, dividing, metastasizing. And computer models have predicted an additional 10,000 breast cancer deaths for this upcoming year, simply because because of COVID and delayed screening and detection. At the very same time, the behaviors that we know proof positive contribute to not only the causation of breast cancer, but often it's, often it's pro proliferation and metastasis are dramatically on the rise. So we're talking about people not exercising, right? Gyms and parks are closed at times. And so they can't get outside and they are getting more and more sedentary. They're working from home. So that also keeps their butts on the couch and their arms within reach of this high caloric, comforting, snacky food. So people are not really paying attention to the nutritional choices as much as they should. And they're going for all of these comfort foods and eating more calories. They're gaining weight, right? The COVID curves, the COVID-19 is um, referring to the weight gain that's rampant. Alcohol contributes to breast cancer and is madly on the rise. Like, in-store sales are up 26%, and there's been like a 500% increase of online purchases in alcohol. Um, and people are just stressed out. And this, to me, is one of the silent killers when it comes to all cancers. And that is manifested by this one study, LACE, Life After Cancer Epidemiology Study. It followed 2,200 early stage breast cancer patients for 9.4 years. And they found that those who reported out low levels of psychosocial support and a lack of religious or social participation were 58% more likely to have died from their breast cancer in that follow-up period. That really speaks to the mind-body connection and how powerful stress can be in promoting this inflammatory little micro environment for cells to flourish. So COVID is packing a double whammy. Detection is down and all the behaviors that increase cancer's proliferation and metastasis are on the rise. I'd love your thoughts on our general state of health in the United States and specifically our standard American diet of choice? Oh, our standard American diet of choice has to do with a ton of animal protein and animal fat, right? It's pancakes and bacon, steak and eggs. It's a hamburger and fries. It's a big old fried chicken steak for dinner and maybe a piece of broccoli on the side. So this type of diet has sadly led to all of our major killers. But on the happy side, wait a minute, if it's such a major contributor, then we have so much control over our own health, way more than we've ever been led to believe. If dad died of a heart attack and his dad died of a heart attack, you're like, Rah, heart attacks run in my family. You know, maybe, or maybe it's all the butter and bacon that runs in your family's habits of eating. So the state of health in America is tragic, but excitingly, it's reversible in the vast majority of disease states we're talking about. Our number one killer is heart disease. One in four Americans will die of heart disease. 40%, 39.5% of Americans will get cancer in some form. That is our number two killer. The number one cancer is breast, number two lung, number three uh, prostate, four colorectal, five melanoma, and on and on. But if you think about those top five that I just named, way to a greater rather than lesser degree, the vast majority of those cancer cases are entirely preventable through informed, smart dietary and lifestyle choices. So that's very exciting to me. And then going on, our number five killer is stroke. One in 20 will die from stroke. Our number six killer, one in 10 people have Alzheimer's. And that to me is it, it, one of, they're all tragic, but Alzheimer's when you have this strong body, but the mind is gone is such a devastating and sad disease, uh, most notably for all of the loved ones that surround that particular person. So I, I think, oh, and then I, I'd be remiss not to mention, oh, 70% of all Americans are overweight or obese. And obesity is a main contributor to a number of killers. 
heart disease and colorectal disease and diabetes. So 10% of Americans are diabetic, which is our number seven killer. 90 to 95% of those people are type two diabetics, largely diet and lifestyle, if not entirely. And then a shocking secret is that one in three Americans have prediabetes and the majority of them have no idea about it. So this upcoming horrible disease that can lead to everything from kidney failure to leg amputation and blindness and heart attacks and death is lurking just under the surface of their choices and they have, they have no idea. So the state of health in America because of SAD, the standard American diet is tragic, but I see a ton of hope through education and empowerment. Could you please share the whole story of how and why you personally became plant-based from the beginning, the whole story? From the beginning, this story doesn't go back that far, to be honest. So I decided to write a book called Breasts, the Owner's Manual. And I wanted to cover everything from all the risk-reducing dietary and lifestyle behaviors that women could embrace to empower them to take control as best they can over never getting breast cancer if they already have it in reducing the risk of recurrence or if they're already stage four in maximizing the longevity they have. So that was my vision for the book. And I was bound and determined as I've been my whole life to be factually accurate. So every single time I said any statistic, any fact, I backed it up with a reference. There's like 60 pages of 1500 references or something in the back. And some of it would be super basic. And I like, for example, for 20 years, I've been saying 80% of all breast cancer is fueled by estrogen. And then I'd go to type it and I think, maybe it's 78, maybe it's 82 now, maybe it's changed. I better be current and sure, right? So I dive into the research and make sure my facts were correct. I wanted the book, of course, to be spreading only truth. I needed it to be bulletproof because I knew bullets would fly. And, you know, let's face it, I just have that personality. Like, I want to be right. It makes me super delightful to be married to. Okay, so I dive in now to the nutritional science to prove that the way I ate was correct. Let's back up for two seconds. I'm a product of the 80s. I was high school and college in the 80s. Bread, pasta, rice, and potatoes, just looking at that would make you fat, okay? It was super low-carb, high-protein, low-fat, too, the low-fat phase. And I kind of carried that with me the rest of my life. These, these starchy foods were not in my diet or they were a major cheat uh, if I ever had like pasta for dinner. So with that in mind, I largely ate Mediterranean diet style, tons of chicken, turkey, and fish. So, so much fish. I'm sure that my husband and I were radioactive. I never wanted to check mercury levels or anything like that because I, blah, 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 I didn't want to know. I didn't want to change. I loved my sushi, which we had like three times a week. And truth be told, I was queen of the cheese platter at parties. I made a mean, like the five-year aged Gouda, Manchego, the Breeze. I had my cheese platter like sine qua non. Okay, so the dive into the nutritional science it didn't take long before I was utterly blown away by the depth of research that existed in these journals that I had never cracked open in my life. Because if you don't know, MDs don't get one second of nutrition. I mean, they might get, I think, an hour now in medical school. But I went to med school in 92. There wasn't a peep of nutrition. So then you go through your residency, my surgical residency, five years there, my fellowship in breast surgical oncology, one year there, never a peep about nutrition. So then you grow up and you're like busy turning away in your day, doing all the things that you've been so excited to train for. And now it's really yours, your practice and your working day all day. Um, and then you go home, you go home to maybe, you know, children or you want to work out, or you're going to eat Like you're really not going to crack open a journal that you've never heard of to see if there are any pearls of wisdom in nutritional science which by the way, if there were, someone should have told me by now, right? So that's why I kind of <laughs> digressing from my own story to tell you, I'm giving myself an excuse and all of my fellow doctors, but um, time to wake up. The excuses don't play out and they're killing you, everyone you love and your patients unwittingly. So let's uh, focus on truth, which I did. And now my eyes are wide open. I'm reading study after study after study. And uh, oh my gosh, this is when I discovered 
one of my heroes, Michael Greger and nutritionfacts.org. So I'm watching video after video, like just absorbing all of this. It was like I had just found Game of Thrones and I was watching, binge watching it like someone on crack. I was like, are, are avocados good for you? It's 2 a.m. I don't know. Click play. Like I had to find out about the avocados. And I just dove in like this for weeks. And finally, uh, after seeing Dean Ornish's study with the Lifestyle Heart Trial and looking at um, the IARC ruling on processed and red meat in July uh, 2015 and how I didn't know about it. And here I was doing all of this research in 2017. And it was the IARC reading that was my tipping point. If you don't know what I'm talking about, there was a question posed to the IARC, International Agency for Research on Cancer, part of the World Health Organization. They are bought by no one. And that's really important to emphasize. So here they are meeting in Lyon, France. There are um, about 22 researchers from 10 different countries pouring over 800 epidemiologic studies simply to answer the questions, does red meat cause cancer? Does processed meat cause cancer? And they concluded that all processed meat so you might call them friendly words like sausage and bacon and hot dogs and all deli meat, right? So all the sliced little organic chicken and turkey breasts in your deli section are absolutely carcinogenic to humans on the same list as asbestos and tobacco and plutonium. And red meat is probably carcinogenic to humans. We know it causes colorectal cancer. But here I was thinking, really? And at the time, my our three sons who are triplets had just turned eight. And like any good mom, I was passing on my complex carbohydrate fear. So they got sandwiches without bread. <laughs> I had literally done something now embarrassing to the hilt. Um, I would take organic turkey breast and wrap it around an organic mozzarella stick and then put all that like with lettuce and some other and I get, give it to them as a breadless sandwich a little lettuce wrap of carcinogens and um when I read that ARC a I A R C ruling I was like you mean I should have just been wrapping cigarettes for their lunch instead I ran downstairs checked in with Andy to make sure he was on board which he overwhelmingly was boys 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 call him over my three eight-year-old sons come trotting over to the fridge and i throw open the doors with great panache and i declare boys we're going vegan and they were like yeah what is vegan <laughs> and um literally that moment i got paper bag i thought i just needed one i needed four paper bags that we filled to the brim with anything and everything that had animal fat or animal protein my little sacred drawer of back off mommy's therapy cheese drawer. All that went in the bag. The salmon filet I just bought for barbecue that Sunday, which we did every Sunday, always salmon, always chicken. And then I went into the freezer and I started looking at like the organic veggie burgers and in the middle of all that list of stuff would be cheese or milk. So that went in the bag. And we took those four bags of food over to my parents who lived a mile away and we're like, here, Honestly, my parents are 90 and they grew up in the depression and they would truly never talk to me again if they knew I had thrown away hundreds of dollars of perfectly carcinogenic food. Um, and that was it. We never looked back. Uh, to be honest, I going forward said, okay, boys, we can have one cheat meal a week if we really want our salmon or whatnot. The next week they had a piece of pizza at camp. They had gone to summer camp and uh, they came home and they're like, mom, we don't want it. We don't even want cheat day. So that was it, 100%. Uh, vegan and entirely whole food plant-based. I mean, you know, occasional processed uh, little beyond meat burger or something as a, as a, that's our cheat day now is to have something like that. They are so cute. They completely get it. They will come home from school and be like, mom, so-and-so she has Lunchables every day at school. She's so going to get diabetes. <laughs> and that's the story. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So we've established that you're a plant-based breast cancer surgeon. Great. <laughs> now to ask this very clearly, why do our boobs like plants? Oh, okay. Our breasts, I have to be official when I say that word, love plants because of the nutrients that plants give every single breast cell. So you have to 
realize this first. Every single time you lift fork to mouth and you chew and swallow, whatever you are chewing and swallowing gets absorbed through your intestinal tract into your bloodstream. And whatever chemicals are in that bloodstream flowing around end up saturating and bathing your cells. This is called a cellular microenvironment. So what is in that bathtub is always either screaming out pro-cancer or anti-cancer. And it's doing it specifically as it relates to breast cancer, but really all cancers, is by changing estrogen levels, growth hormones, particularly IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor, the big daddy growth promoter of all the hormones that can be inside your body. It can increase or decrease angiogenesis, angio blood vessel, genesis, birth, the birth of blood flow. So every single cancer cell, breast and other, needs to create its own blood supply to itself if it wants to grow beyond the size of a tip of a ballpoint pen. And believe me, it wants to grow. So angiogenesis brings that cell the nutrients it needs to grow. And then imagine this, when it gets to and it, its little adult size, exit strategy, straight out those same blood vessels, straight into your liver or lung or bone. Inflammation, free radical formation, immune system function. Every time you chew and swallow, you're choosing to either promote cancer or kill cancer. And that's why food affects breasts. When you ask specifically about plants. So there are phytochemicals, plant-based chemicals that we generally call phytonutrients are just nutrients because no one wants to even think of kale as like releasing chemicals. But in point of fact, and this is important for my more scientifically minded people out there, that's what's so beautiful for a scientifically minded person coming to like the argument of plant-based or not, they will wrap their minds around the chemistry of it all and start to understand that truly on a molecular level, these plants are releasing chemicals that have effects on the downstream cellular function. So in less kind of fancy terms, you take turmeric, you've got curcumin, green tea, epigallocatechin gallate, EGCG. You take red grapes, the skin, resveratrol. You take um, soy, genistine. So these molecular components become nutrients, which are literally bathing those cells decreasing the estrogen that remember fuels 80% of all breast cancers, decreasing IGF-1, the big growth promoter, which by the way, if you can't process IGF-1, you'll never get cancer. It's already been proven. There are people in Ecuador, they have something called Larenz syndrome. They can't process IGF-1. They are all um, medical, they all have medical dwarfism because they can't grow. And no one in the history of the world with Larenz syndrome has ever had breast cancer or type two diabetes, just sidebar. These same chemicals will decrease angiogenesis, stop that blood flow influx to the cancer cell, decrease inflammation, boost the effects of your immune system to be able to de -de 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 target out, seek and destroy cancer cells. Probably the most powerful of all phytochemicals or nutrients that has yet to be studied I would have to award it to sulforaphane, which you're getting from your cruciferous vegetables. Of all the breast, the healthiest breast superfoods, I mean, I have a, about 14 of them and the, most of them are in my antioxidant smoothie, which if you don't know about it, Google it and drink it like most days of the week because it is so packed with antioxidant powers and it tastes delicious. People love it because the base is a uh, a cup and a half of soy milk and then two fistfuls of greens and then like two cups of berries, which are so powerful with their pro cyanidins. And um, then everything else you put in there, you can't really taste. So it's just deliciousness. And then you throw in the, the turmeric and the omla and the green tea and you get it all in one drink, like you're superhuman for the day. Not literally. So, so forafane, um, is a big one and soy is a huge one. We can bust that myth if you want to and flax seeds. Those are my top three. Get them in you some way, somehow, every single day. Two tablespoons of ground flax seeds. Highest content of lignans of almost any plant food on the planet. Lignans are powerful anti-estrogens and anti, they have other anti-cancer properties. So, so much so that there are some great studies that we could go through, but they like, okay. So one of my favorites, because it's so simple to like wrap your mind around. A bunch of women had a biopsy of breast cancer 
and half of them are given a placebo muffin and half are given a flaxseed muffin. Okay, a muffin, we're talking vegan junk food. The flaxseed muffin had two tablespoons of ground flax seeds in it, that amount. They ate it every single day. And then five weeks later, they had their definitive breast cancer surgery. And so now we have two specimens before and after the muffin, their cancer biopsy, and then their cancer excised. Three main things were looked at under the microscope on these cancers before and after the flaxseed. One was the division rate, it's proliferation. How many cells under the microscope right now are one becoming two? It's called the KI-67. Another one was CRB2 protein, a marker of aggression, like you know, ugliness. Um, and the third one was apoptosis, which is a really fun way of explaining cancer cell suicide, which is just like programmed cell death. Time for you to go and you know it and you kill yourself. So we've got the baseline numbers on the core and then they eat this muffin for five weeks. What happened? The proliferation rate, the division, went down 34% in the flaxseed group. The CRB2 expression went down 71%. And apoptosis, cancer cell suicide, went up 31%. Just from five weeks of eating flax seeds, everything else in their diet was the same. Everything. So that's the power of flax. And I've got a lot more data than that to, that I could share. So those are my top three. And that is a somewhat long-winded explanation about why what you chew and swallow affects your breasts. All right. So apart from eating a whole foods plant-based diet, what else should we be doing for breast cancer prevention? So there are boulders that can sit on the scale of your life, pushing you toward breast cancer or away, toward any cancer and illness, in fact, or away. And if you have a boulder on your scale, I suggest you really start working on mm, chipping away at it and lifting it off so that you have a your best fighting chance against this looming disease. So the boulders we've hit one of them is diet and nutrition, and it will weigh you down toward cancer if you're eating predominantly or a lot, or maybe any animal protein and animal fat, and you will lift it higher if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet. Boulder number two, <sighs> obesity. I mentioned 70% of Americans are overweight or obese. And while this is totally not about fat shaming, which is always cruel and unkind and uncalled for, what overweight people need to know is that this whole movement sort of, of, of um, fat and fabulous, it really is dangerous to your health and could kill you because so many disease processes are promoted by that excess weight that you're carrying. So I encourage everybody to just Google up uh, body mass index. We've got a calculator at pinklotus.com. You just BMI and find out if you're too chubby. And if you are, make a solid plan to lose that weight because the great news, well, I should tell you the bad news. The bad news is that if you are overweight or obese, you have 50 to 250% more breast cancer occurrence, recurrence, and death than you would if you were in your ideal body weight range. But the good news is that if you lose the weight, you lose the risk. So that's boulder two. Boulder three, alcohol. Alcohol increases breast cancer because it increases estrogen levels. It is a carcinogen, acetaldehyde forms. Even if you just put it in your mouth and spit it out, you already make acetaldehyde and swallow it down. It impairs the immune system. But the main driver, it seems from studies, of why alcohol pushes toward breast and many other cancers is that it interferes with this enzyme that sounds like a really bad word, MTHFR, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase is what it really stands for. And this enzyme takes folic acid from vitamins folate from your lovely leafy greens and turns it into methylfolate. This is the activated form that babysits DNA as it divides to make sure that it stays true to its original form. Oh, it mutated. Let me fix it or throw it out. Love yourself some methylfolate. But 30 to 50% of people just by birth already have a suboptimal MTHFR. Not enough usually if um, they're just eating normal amounts of fruits and vegetables that they would notice the impairment. But if you drink, then you really knock that enzyme out for the day. Now you don't have your DNA babysitter and cancer arises and it's undetected, unstopped and proliferates. 
part of the Nurses Health Study too, looked at women over time and pulled out the subset of drinkers. So amongst women who drank one or more glasses of any kind of alcohol daily, those with the highest folate consumption uh, amounting to 600 micrograms a day versus the lowest amongst drinkers, those consuming the folate had 89% less breast cancer. So that speaks to kind of front loading this enzyme's job with so much over here that it can churn out enough to babysit the DNA. So that's, um, that's the those are the mechanisms by which alcohol contributes to breast cancer, but by how much? So a drink, a drink in America is five ounces of wine equals 12 ounces of beer equals 1.5 ounces of hard liquor. So get whichever poison in your mind that you want to. And here are the stats. As opposed to a non-drinker, a drink a day increases breast cancer by 10%, two drinks a day, 30%, three drinks a day, 40%, and onwards and upwards from there. So alcohol, boulder. Fourth boulder, exercise or the lack thereof. Exercise reduces estrogen levels, but it also uh, releases the, it just, it ultimately builds up your immune system. And it also helps maintain body fat loss. So how much exercise is enough and which exercise is the best? If you wanna look at the National Institutes of Health and use them as the bar, which you should, you need to have five hours weekly of exercise where you're just kind of like sauntering and can to chat with a friend or maybe even sip coffee. If you're going to put pep in your step, moderate to vigorous exercise, you need two and a half hours a week. But if those numbers sound astoundingly high to you because you just think you're so super busy or you haven't exercised in, if you might be honest, a decade or more, and that sounds impossible, I'm going to share a study. This will encourage you. 17,000 postmenopausal women were um, followed for 7.9 years. And those who simply just walked briskly for 11 minutes a day had 18% less breast cancer. Okay, you can walk briskly for 11 minutes a day. And if you can't, walk for however many you can and try to do more tomorrow. If you put some pep in your step, and some time into the week. Three to four hours a week of vigorous exercise drops breast cancer rates by 30 to 40%. Five plus hours, 57% drop. So the more, the better, but I'll take what you'll give me. Now, which exercise is best? Whichever one you'll do, I'll take anything. So those are our boulders. We've got diet and nutrition, alcohol, exercise, obesity. Next, we have pebbles. These are things that, yeah, they can tip a scale for sure. I'm not denying that. But if you've got a boulder on there, the pebble's not going to make low any lower. So these are hormone replacement therapy, environmental toxicities, and emotional stress. So there's a lot you can control beyond diet and nutrition. And I really love helping women navigate how to incorporate more lifestyle changes into their armamentarium to fight against an existing breast cancer or maybe they're at an elevated risk and already in tune to the disease and want to maximally reduce their risk. So in addition to diet, we talk about exercise, we talk about their weight and what to do if they're overweight and need to drop a few. We talk about alcohol, which by the way, as an aside, if you choose to drink, the American Cancer Society doesn't advocate that you start drinking, but it says keep it to no more than one drink a day for women, two drinks a day for men. And I will tell you um, that if you choose to drink, you might want to favor red wine because it has a couple of redemptive qualities, specifically resveratrol, which is an anti-proliferative, anti-neoplastic um, agent even looked at in trials right now to treat cancers. And it's an aromatase inhibitor fancy words again, um, aromatase, an enzyme. Everywhere you have a fat cell, you have aromatase. Aromatase takes precursor steroids from your adrenal gland, like testosterone and androstenedione, dione, and turns it into estrogen. So that's an estrogen fuel source that red wine cuts out for the day, the aromatase inhibitor. Um, so we talk about drinking and we then move on to some of the pebbles and Sleep is really important. Melatonin and its secretion gives your body that time to do cell rejuvenation and repair. It gives your immune system 
the breath of fresh air from digesting the meals that people eat like three to six times a day, it keeps your immune system a little diverted. But then now at night, you can really seek out and destroy and target some, some cancer cells because nothing else is uh, taking up its attention and time. Fasting, very powerful tool when it comes to allowing that cell rejuvenation and repair, the targeting of um, dysplastic or deranged crazy cells, i.e. cancer cells or just mutated cells. Fasting um, in one study in 2015 showed a 36% drop in breast cancer recurrence for those who simply didn't eat for 13 consecutive hours daily. And the more, the better. So trying to fast 13 to 16 on a nightly basis is cancer protective, as is doing a more prolonged fast, like a five-day fast, like a fasting mimicking diet if you can't go water only. There's a lot of data behind that. And daily prayer and meditation, using an app if you need to, meditation, which to a lot of people just sounds too like, um, you know, 60s and uh out there for them. I encourage them just to deep breathe, take one big deep inhale in for three seconds and exhale for six seconds and do that a few times and see if you don't already notice. You will stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system just by doing that, calming you down, releasing the antithesis to those stress-inducing catecholamines like epinephrine. There's a lot of power behind meditation on a cellular level. It can decrease blood pressure and increase focus and attention. And it also gives your immune system that boost that it needs. So those are just a few ideas behind what you can do beyond nutrition to dramatically affect your breast cancer risks and outcomes. <sighs> okay. So, Did you just deep breathe? <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Okay. So diet and nutrition. Is diet and nutrition number one? You mentioned it first, and no doubt at Plant-Based News, we love talking about plant-based nutrition. Is it safe to say that diet and nutrition are number one on your list? I think it's the top thing you should focus on. I think it carries the a ton of impact. It's hard to measure um, um, and create, you know, crown somebody king of the risk reduction. But if I had to choose, I would pick that for a couple of reasons. One, it's immediate. It is immediate. Let me share this with you. When women come and tell me, oh, doc, come on, I'm 65. I look like this. I have cancer. I've never exercised. And it's too late for me. I always say, mm -mm, sister, never too late. Let me tell you about a study. 50 obese women. Their blood was checked for IGF-1 levels. We've talked about how that's the huge growth promoter and IGF-1 binding protein, kind of like this body snatcher that retires IGF-1 from circulation. Then they took their blood and dripped it onto a Petri dish blanketed with human breast cancer cells. Yeah, a few cells died because if you're alive, your immune system's probably doing something that could kill off a few cancer cells. So these women then go away with instructions to follow the Pritikin plan from Nathan Pritikin a low fat, high fiber, whole food plant-based diet and daily exercise. And by exercise, we're kind of talking about those ladies who saunter for 11 minutes a day, but they have to do it for 30 minutes a day. And they go away for 12 years, months, weeks, days. 12 days later, they come back, draw the blood, IGF-1 plummeted, binding protein skyrocketed, new blood draw, new Petri dish filled with breast cancer cells, drop that blood on there and shoo, the majority of cancer cells die on the spot. In less than two weeks, these women have transformed their blood into a cancer kicking machine. Weight loss takes time. Building up the benefits of exercise takes time. Alcohol, you can stop immediately, um, but that the power of food, as evidenced by just that simple story of a study, um, is immediate. So if we want to start getting immediate anti-cancer power coursing through our veins, then I suggest we focus on the food. Thank you for that. So genes, nature versus nurture. Doctor, I just really have terrible genes. What do you say? So when it comes to nature versus nurture, 
Mm, nurture really wins every single time. Breast cancer specifically, literally only five to 10% tops of all breast cancer in the world can be attributed to an inherited genetic mutation from either mom or dad, specifically things like BRCA or BRCA, PALB2, CHECK2. These are really few and far between, not to minimize the devastation that they can cause generation after generation within certain family lines when they exist. Because there's a 50-50 chance that a parent with said mutation will pass it down to a child. So there's high penetrance and a lot of them carry super high risk of future cancers. BRCA, for example, up to 87% lifetime risk of breast cancer, up to 44% chance of ovarian cancer, which is often highly lethal because it's so hard to detect. So I don't wanna minimize the fact that there are gene mutations that heavily predispose certain individuals to cancers but it's very few, five to 10%. On the other end of our bell curve, we might have another 5% of just inexplicable, right? Some 22 year old who gets breast cancer, she doesn't even live long enough, badly enough to explain this if she doesn't have a gene mutation. So that's a little difficult and confusing, but in the middle there, we've got a solid 90 to 95% of all breast cancers that can be not attributed to genes. So who, get, who can we blame if we can't blame our parents or fate? And without actually calling it blame, but rather seeing it as the empowerment that it is, you, every time you eat or don't eat something, think or don't think, move or don't move, stress and don't stress, these are controllable choices and nurture wins out over nature. I'd love to shift gears and talk a little bit about what you're seeing at your practice, Pink Lotus. Have you had any patients who have gone plant-based and seen significant improvement? Yes, I've got one on top of my mind because her operation was so recent. So I saw this particular woman who was 64 years old, obese, and eating a standard American diet, diagnosed with invasive breast cancer, in her right breast with other biopsies showing that there was a span of in situ cancer of 14 centimeters. So a big area of in situ cancer, an invasive cancer for sure. And she was not de declining surgery, but she had, I don't remember if she read my book or heard a podcast, but she knew of me and visited me specifically to strategize over what she could do to potentially save her breast. Because the way it was now, there was no choice but mastectomy. The, the disease was so extensive that, yeah, you could carve it all out, but then you'd be left with like some sort of like smiley face of a rim of breast on the underside that was not going to make anybody smile. So in that case, it would look prettier to remove the breast and maybe put in a breast-shaped implant or use her own body fat to repair the area. But the point is she wanted to try to keep her breast and she knew she couldn't the way the disease spanned now. So we started talking about all of it, everything we've talked about. I encouraged her again on the whole food plant-based diet, weight loss, fasting, fasting mimicking diet, uh, daily prayer and meditation, socialization with friends and uh, exercise. So on top of it, her tumor was strongly estrogen driven. This is important. There are about 21 subtypes of breast cancer. And there are certain subtypes that if you came to me as this patient did, I would make it very clear that I thought it was very risky in terms of your potentially dying from this if we were talking about one of these wildly aggressive subtypes. You have to realize that cancer has had such a head start on you in terms of your knowledge that, ah, that's in my breast. You know, women wake up and they feel a lump that wasn't there yesterday. If it's a two centimeter estrogen driven invasive cancer. It was there yesterday and last week and last year and eight years ago. So not that someone missed it, but on a cellular level, it's been recruiting all those things that we've talked about. It's been getting it. Oh, do you know that cancers can make their own estrogen from the aromatase enzyme in the fat cell in your breast right next to it. So it doesn't even need you for uh, fueling itself with the estrogens. So in other words, when you get a particularly aggressive subtype, it has such a head start that really at that point, lentils and kale are 
fairly helpless against something that's already so well established. Now, if we just ch chunk that out of you, now all of your interventions with diet and lifestyle are gonna be wildly effective at seeking out and destroying rogue cells that are trying to just start their little life out there in the lung or the liver or recurring in the breast. But these sizable cancers are often so advanced and so aggressive that they're just out competing you, okay? So I wanna make that clear. This woman had this plodding, low division rate, super estrogen driven cancer. So we go through all the anti-estrogen foods. We talked about my smoothie. We added in amla and the green tea and the turmeric and the pepper and all the ingredients in the smoothie. We made sure she was eating anti-estrogenic foods, which the main ones are gonna be your cruciferous vegetables, your flax seeds, soy, mushrooms are aromatase inhibitors, particularly, get this, the cheapo white button, beats them all out, portobello, crimini, whatever white button. Um, so we do mushrooms, citrus, fruits, and fiber. And she actually also took an anti-estrogen pill. So, you know, maybe tamoxifen as a name. She took an aromatase inhibitor, which makes sense. Here we've got this overweight postmenopausal woman with an estrogen-driven cancer. Her ovaries have kicked out years ago. Where is she getting her estrogen? Well, she's going to stop eating animal estrogen, right? The animals are animals, so they have estrogen too. And a lot of them are pumped with extra estrogen or xeranol in beef, I digress. And so her only source of estrogen are these fat cells of which she has many, many and extra. So we give her a pill that's an aromatase inhibitor to effectively and completely knock out that estrogen fueling enzyme. She goes away for three months and then we repeat mammography to make sure that the span of calcium that represents her in situ cancer isn't expanding. And in fact, it's shrinking. So she's motivated to make it through the holidays at this point, um, which would put us another three months away. And everything's going in the right direction, so that's fine. So six months later, she comes back, we get a mammogram and an MRI. MRI had shown what invasive cancer? Her, it was 2.0 six centimeters, I want to remember, it was definitely large-ish. And it was gone on the MRI, on the MRI. And then DCIS, the in situ 14 centimeters, looked like it had come down to about four centimeters. So off we go to the operating room. And I remove the, the areas of concern. And the final pathology showed that where she had had a rock solid 2.6 centimeter invasive cancer, she did still have some invasive cancer, but it was scattered little foci of cells and there was no DCIS. So that was powerful because now this woman who's able to preserve her breast, I had to take out that area, but then it was remodeled with like a lift reduction and the other side to match. She looks like she just simply had a breast reduction for cosmetic reasons, her breasts look great. She does need radiation on that side um, because recurrence rates are notoriously high around 40% without the radiation. And most important of all, she realized the power of her own actions and choices on cellular dysfunction. Like how crazy is that to, to really see inside your own body that eating this and doing that and thinking that, and by the way, she'd lost like 70 pounds in that time it was amazing. Um, and she's still overweight, so she has a ways to go, but she's so incentivized by seeing what those choices did to an existing cancer, she's transformed forever. She's completely sold. And you know what? So am I on something I wasn't entirely sure about um, before, and that is the ability to reverse DCIS. I'd seen this in studies when I was writing my book um, in, there's a cadaver study with, I believe, 854 breasts were examined in women who had died from like a car accident. They'd never been diagnosed with breast cancer in their known lifetimes. And this remarkable study showed that in women 40 to 50 years old, 39% of the breasts had DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ. But between 50 and 70 year olds, 10% DCIS. Where did all the DCIS go? 75% of DCIS, it seems, regresses spontaneously after you pass that magical really menopause time. So I knew that DCIS can spontaneously regress when your ovaries kick out. Theoretically, that's why that 
disparity was there. Another study looked at um, atra all trans retinoic acid dripped on petri dishes of human breast cancer and normal. So we've got normal cells, atypical cells, we talked about this, DCIS cells and invasive cancer cells. And they drip this atra, trans retinoic acid, which you can get from your you know, vitamin A packed veggies. Um, and the DCIS and atypia regressed to normal cells, but the invasions persisted. So I did know that you could seem like you could reverse DCIS, but I was even blown away. I was even blown away to see how her lifestyle changes truly eradicated a 14 centimeter span of DCIS. So it's safe to say that you're completely bought into plant-based eating. I'm a lifer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We are too. In your opinion, how do we make plant-based eating more accessible? I mean, if it's just so abundantly clear that this is the way that we should all be heading, how do we start breaking down those walls, especially for people that might not necessarily have the same opportunity at the supermarket as others? You simply make it accessible by making it profitable for the same companies that are already profiting handsomely, ridiculously from animal agriculture. So you can't expect them to go, go quietly into that good night. <laughs> they will fight and fight with money and lobbyists and probably win for quite some time. So you, we have to transform how this, that industry creates its products and let them maintain their profits. For example, instead of being a dairy milk farm, let's take those same machines and equipment and turn it into an organic soy milk mill, right? I think that's going to be one key component. The other is education of doctors, especially in these cities where you're mentioning they have poor access to quality foods. They often are seen in local clinics by their community doctor. Those doctors need to be reached. The fastest way to affect change will be to affect somebody who has a downstream audience that they're directly connected to emotionally or on a trust basis, such as the community physician. So how do we reach those people? It's through, for example, the work of PCRM. So one of my um, biggest heroes in the plant-based movement is Dr. Neil Barnard and the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is responsible for promoting so much good in the physician community in terms of free access to apps, to information. They put on amazing conferences. Most importantly, they affect policy change at the government level, successfully suing the USDA a few times now, uh, not to mention that they've eliminated animal testing on cosmetic products in California, which kind of translates to the rest of this country. And now they're doing it effectively in China. They've eliminated all animal testing and dog labs and all the medical schools throughout the country. So they're just so active on a political level and looking at environmental and animal rights, but most actively in human benefit from eating plant food diets. They sponsor a number of studies that show again and again, the benefits of plant-based diets are constantly coming out with publications. And I couldn't be more honored or proud to be, serve on their president's council, but it's through work, the work of PCRM and organizations like it that we're going to reach these physicians and communities. And then the other is just to support and publicize this groundswell of regular people that are just appropriately, accurately self-educated on the benefits of being plant-based. And then they embrace that lifestyle on their own and see dramatic changes, right? They drop a bunch of pounds, they're off insulin, all of a sudden their blood pressure normalizes and they go in to their doctor who's blown away and says, what did you do? And they share the story. And ironically, all of the studies that turned my mind and made me go 180 into a vegan lifestyle um, don't somehow reach those doctors, right? We talked about why the actual studies don't get read by them, but this one person suddenly is an amazing um, N of one in their own world, which opens their eyes to the possibilities. We also need to create government laws that mandate better choices in these supermarkets. Like if it's a law that you have to have fresh fruits and vegetables, if it's a law, which again, PCRM, thank you, uh, that in California, all prisons 
and hospitals have to offer a vegan entree option. By the way, they only accepted that bill when they dropped schools from it. Oh, hi, Derry. Okay, so those kinds of laws need to get passed and, and you start to infiltrate. You start to infiltrate at multiple levels on the political level, on the emotional level, on the actual anecdotal story level, which carries a lot of power with social media and the individual physicians. I just think it needs to have many tentacles out there in the workings of individuals' lives, communities' lives, the physician community, the government, policy, and lobbyists. It's complicated, it's multifactorial, but that's the only way to come after it. Spot on. All right. This has been a really fun conversation with you. How can eating plant-based be fun? There are a couple of great ways to make plant-based eating fun right now with your next meal. One is to take your favorite meal and see how you can morph it. We did this in my family with our burrito bar. So, you know, when you've got young kids who are picky eaters, one of the best strategies is to lay out like 10 to 20 items on something. Like I've got a whole salad bar thing I do and I got a whole burrito bar thing I do. I've got a whole sushi bar, veg veggie sushi bar now uh, that I do. But even before we were entirely plant-based, I had these same meals, right? So they're familiar to the kids and they love them because they pick and choose and they build it themselves. And they're bound to eat it. So the, one of the first meals we transformed was the burrito bar, which has whole grain tortillas, right? Some natural, amazingly yummy uh plant-based foods already in the burrito bar, right? You've got your um, salsa and some guacamole and some shredded lettuce. And um, I put in some sauteed vegetables, but then in days of yore, it was usually like um, t uh, shredded turkey breast, you know, crumbles. That was a, like a turkey crumble thing. I forget what to call these foods now. <laughs> um, and then you had sour cream that was real cream. And then I had shredded cheddar cheese that was real cheddar. So now how do you sub out those three things? Because those are the bugaboo when you go plant-based. I just saute up a block of tofu, right? Press that thing, put it in the pan with some broth in there and saute it up with some spices and boom, that's the replacement for the turkey. Sour cream, I've got a great cashew cream recipe. So you put that in the food processor with some cashews and some water, nutritional yeast, a little salt and garlic, uh, garlic powder, brr, amazing sour cream. And um, the cheese, I sometimes substitute, sometimes don't. I call these cheat foods so you can go get your like, brand name, vegan brand name slices um, or shreds and put those in there too. But when we are addressing the people who are like, I want me some steak and potatoes or a cheeseburger now, then you use these processed vegan foods that are making a killing out there like impossible burgers and light life little meatballs that are plant-based as what we now term transition foods because they will satisfy your palate because they're chuck full of saturated fat and salt, and they're going to make your palate accept it as an acceptable substitute to that beefy burger that you're wanting to taste. But with time, I would encourage people to, to as their palates change, I love to tell my kids that their taste buds, uh, they change every 14 days. So have you heard them say to each other when they don't even know I can hear them, like, you know, it's been more than 14 days since you had a mushroom, you really have to try it again. <laughs> And it's true. Remember, so you turn over 50 billion cells a day. So you have a whole new taste bud cell. It, the palate of it, though, the desire of the cell probably hasn't changed that radically every two weeks. But basically, there are studies showing like the saltiness with which you'll salt your own soup decreases within a week. When you're just forced to have less salt, you'll never resalt the way you did on day one. If you're forced to eat a less salty soup for a week, that tastes like, whoa, a salt lick, right? So people's palates do change. And all of a sudden, the craving for the beef burger got downgraded to a craving for like an impossible burger can get downgraded to a homemade bean and lentil burger. And so those are the two ways to make it fun. It's just not to be rigid about it all and not to have like an end game that is perfection, right? The perfect diet that's all homemade by you and no ingredients that are something like palm oil that you wouldn't have in your house, right? So that's the end game, but to go straight from being a, per, a pepperoni pizza lover to that person is probably not sustainable. And I want you in this for the rest of your life. So if you have to do baby steps to get there, that's the best way to do it. 
I'm Ocean Robbins, co-host of the Food Revolution Summit, and I've got some good news for you about cancer. In fact, I think it's great news. A growing and convincing body of research tells us that many, many cases of cancer can be prevented. So what's the number one factor you need to focus on if you want to kick cancer to the curb? It's the food on your plate. With the Cancer Fighting Superfoods Guidebook, you'll find out what the studies actually tell us. And you'll get the latest anti-cancer breakthroughs, so you can take immediate action to protect yourself and the people that you love. When you enter your name and email right on this page, you'll get your free guidebook, and you'll also get free access to the 10th Annual 2021 Food Revolution Summit. My dad and colleague, best-selling author John Robbins and I are bringing you this summit because we're on a mission. We want to help as many people as possible stay healthy during the pandemic and beyond. During this free online global event, my dad will personally interview 25 of the most brilliant revolutionary experts as they share this year's breaking updates about food and health. You will leave the Food Revolution Summit inspired and empowered with trustworthy information that you can put to use right away. Just enter your name and email right on this page to join in the free summit and to get your free Cancer Fighting Superfoods guidebook. The truth is, you are meant to thrive at every age and stage of life. No matter what happens in the world of pandemics and politics, this is the time right now to take charge of your health. All you've got to do to get it all for free is to enter your name and email now. And I'll see you in the summit. Let's do this.